there's a new filmmaker out in space. True, the Curiosity rover may never enter the ranks of movie-making legends, but this Martian robot has still managed to capture an impressive little film. I'm Sophie, and welcome to The Countdown. Curiosity snapped a series of images showing the motion of the two moons of Mars. As you watch the pictures in order, you can see the larger moon, Phobos, pass in front of its smaller sibling, Deimos. The resolution in these images is high enough for us to see the individual craters on Phobos. To nab such clear pictures, Curiosity used the two cameras on its mast, which together act as a single instrument called mast cam. And this film is more than just pretty pictures. Using the images, researchers can make more precise measurements of the Martian moon's orbits. This will give us important information about the interactions between Mars and its moons, and could tell us something about the physical structure of the red planet. Today, most rockets release their rear ends on their way into space. This leaves the so-called first stage to fall back to Earth and break up in the atmosphere. But now, SpaceX has a new rocket prototype designed to fly multiple missions. The Falcon 9 rocket is built to be reusable. Instead of self-destructing, the first stage will fly itself back to its launch pad. In order to do so, the rocket must be able to maneuver in midair, and a test vehicle, codenamed the Grasshopper, can do just that. This month, the Grasshopper successfully lifted off in Texas, flew about 100 meters sideways, and then returned home. This achievement is impressive, but there's plenty of work still to be done. The first stage has to undertake far more than a 100 meter journey. It must slow down from a speed of thousands of kilometers per hour, lower itself back into Earth's atmosphere, and then travel hundreds of kilometers back to its launch location. But this flight is still a great first step on the way to a reusable rocket. In a previous Countdown episode, we talked about the International Astronomical Union, or IAU. Specifically, how they can be real killjoys about original names, refusing to take suggestions from the public. Which is why exoplanets, moons, and supernovae end up being called by long strings of letters and numbers. But the IAU is finally opening up to more naming options. With caveats, of course. The union requests public naming campaigns and organizations work with the IAU throughout the process. So what if you come up with a great idea for a name on your own? Individuals can send suggestions to the email address iaupublic at iap.fr. But before you submit Krypton, Vulcan, or Tatooine, make sure to check that they haven't already been claimed by another celestial body. This past February, a meteor exploded in the sky over Chelyabinsk, Russia. The fireball, which released 30 times the energy of an atomic bomb, left hundreds of tons of dust in the atmosphere. And thanks to an orbiting satellite, researchers know where all that material went. A few hours after the meteor self-destructed, a plume of dust formed about 40 kilometers up in the sky. As the dust moved, flowing east at more than 300 kilometers per hour, heavier pieces began falling to the ground while the smaller particles stayed aloft. After four days, the plume had rounded the Earth, and it kept on going. Even months after the initial explosion, a ring of dust remained, circling the planet. While we know what happened to the meteor after impact, we still don't know where it came from. One theory, proposed by Spanish scientists, is the meteor belonged to a larger group of asteroids which could also be headed for Earth. So keep your eyes on the sky. How do you measure the gravity at the surface of a star? Well, there are a few different methods, but none of them have been particularly accurate. Until now. According to a new paper in the journal Nature, variations in the brightness of a star may be related to changes in its surface gravity. More flickering in the light corresponds to lower gravity. But that's not all we can learn from starlight. Researchers have turned light waves into sound waves, creating a kind of star music. Here, listen for yourself. This star song can tell us a lot. The tone changes when dark sunspots pass in front of the camera. This tells us how fast the star is spinning. And the hissing noise comes from flickering hot and cold patches, which form as hot gas moves towards the star's surface and cold gas moves towards its interior. This can tell us the size of the star, since larger bodies have more hiss. And that's your countdown. Links to all of these stories are in the description below. Also, don't forget to visit the Space Lab channel on YouTube and subscribe. For Scientific American, I'm Sophie Bushwick, and I'll be jamming out to star music. Good morning.
stars shine. Not that music. Oh, I'd be the 